Ideally, natural and wild spaces offer the best opportunities for children to play freely outdoors. But sometimes we can't always provide this experience easily, especially in urban areas. We can, however, create spaces that offer rich and diverse natural experiences that enable children to not only play how they want to play, but encourages curiosity so they stimulate their senses and explore, test, and expand their physical and cognitive capabilities. We can also create spaces that provide either social interactions or opportunities for independent play. With climate change and its impact on human health, we also want to teach our children about living things and how to care for them. My name is Susan Crawford and I am a playground specialist with over 35 years experience. I'm excited today to be talking about natural playgrounds and natural play spaces. I have been passionate about natural play spaces for many years and have designed several over the past few years. Before we begin, I would like to go over some webinar etiquette. Because we have a large group joining us today, can you make sure your microphones are on mute? If you are having difficulty seeing the presentation, please send a private message and one of our staff will help you troubleshoot the issue. Do send in your questions using the chat, chat feature. You can also send in any comments or feedback throughout this session. We are recording this session and we'll have it on both RecTech and PlayWorks web websites shortly. Finally, please e reach out to me after the presentation if you'd like more insights or have further questions. So let me get, begin by introducing our guest speaker for today. She is author and academic Beverly Dietz from Okanagan College in Kelowna, BC. Beverly is the lead researcher for projects that examine strategies to advance children's outdoor play through training and space design. She is also the author of four textbooks related to play and children's programming and has several peer-reviewed articles published on early childhood topics. Today, Beverly will discuss various topics related to natural play and then I will end the webinar with examples of natural play spaces from across Western Canada. Please join me in welcoming Beverly. Thank you, Susan, and hello, everyone. As Susan mentioned, today's discussion will touch on a few topics from the benefits children receive from playing outdoors in nature and how important this is to the design elements um, for any natural playground. And then looking at the three different uh, playgrounds from across Western Canada. So when we look at the whole notion of outdoor play, what is important for us to understand is as a society, we have reduced the opportunities for children to have the freedom to explore. As you can see on the slide, in 1915, children were able to travel about six miles uh, to go fishing without any adult interaction on um, being on their own. Then as we look at it in the year 2015, children are basically able to go to the end of their street. So this has had an, uh, an incredible impact on the way in which children perceive the importance of play and having the experience to wayfind uh, in their natural environment. The impact of not allowing children to roam over wide spaces has a, a, a direct impact on to the health of children. We have a number of uh, health crisis issues in early childhood uh, right now. When we look at Canada's current health crisis, there is an increase in mental health disorders. Uh, for example, when we look at it from on a medical perspective, uh, in 2006, 2007, and 2017, 2018, the change in rate was a 75% increase in visits to the emergency department and a 65% increase in hospitalizations. Uh, so when we look at this, um, we know that it is a major issue for us to return children to the outdoor play environments. We also know that when children 
do not have access uh, to outdoor play. As you can see on the screen, there is a contributing factor to bullying, childhood depression, anxiety, problems with memory and self-control. These all impact later academic performance. So when we look at the notion of childhood obesity, that too is connected to outdoor play. It is no surprise to any of us that obesity is on the rise across Canada. Many of the issues are the fast food, the video games, the uh, lack of physical activity in our school programs, and the reduction in children having that freedom to engage in outdoor play. This causes children to have a negative thought process about their self-worth and self-esteem. And then this becomes a vicious circle in that it reduces children's desire to play outdoors with peers. What can we do? The time is right. We need to broaden our understanding of play and create those play spaces that ensure children want to be outside, that they have the freedom to explore, um, that the play spaces allow them to engage in social actions um, and opportunities to explore living things. This is vital for us as we redefine children's play and our commitment to the health and wellness of children. When we look at the benefits of natural play, there are many. As you can see on the screen, on, we have identified four major benefits. So it's the whole notion of supporting children's immune systems, um, reducing their anger, anxiety, and stress, or giving them what we call the ability to engage in self-regulation and executive function skills in their um, problem-solving skill set. Um, it is important that we look at the physical activity and how this can support children um, to reduce obesity or becoming overweight. Bullying is greatly reduced uh, when children have the opportunity to engage in nature-based play. Um, so when we look at this, we um, can very clearly articulate uh, much of the research that is now examining why outdoor play is vital and how we need to bring it back into the lives of children. Research uh, from Norway clearly identifies that there is a distinct correlation uh, between children's outdoor play and their ability to uh, progress in school. Children engaged in play are results in healthier children. When we look at nature and outdoor play, as identified on the screen, not all encounters with nature have to be grand. It does not need to be a forest. Any outdoor play environment um, that has some opportunities for children to engage in play has benefits to children. Despite how parents feel, collecting leaves, engaging with rocks and sticks provide endless opportunities for children to play and to learn and to build those principles that are needed for later academic skills. So when we look at play space, we want you to consider a wide range of experiences. What are the opportunities for adventure? What are the ways in which children's imaginations and creativity will be facilitated and stimulated? How is there opportunity for children to nurture the love of plants and animals? What are the ways in which they can explore wayfinding and maps? What are the hills and paths that children can engage in? How do we look at special places for children um, so that they have that freedom to explore? Where are the mini worlds? And then enabling hunting and gathering, which again are tied to dramatic play. These principles come from the work of David Sobel. And um, with that, he identifies if children are exposed to these types of environments, then children over time will emerge as having that connectedness to nature. And of course, as we look at this, on um, each of these components are then tied to the sense of wonderment and curiosity. What is really important is to note that 
play spaces designed by adults for children may not be as interesting or stimulating as they can be. Um, so it is important if we have opportunities for adults and children to have that conversation and collectively look at what good community play space would be for children. Talk with the children, find out what their experiences are, and then observe how they like to play. This makes the, the best opportunities for us to design play spaces that children will participate in. So let's look at each of these topics uh, with more intensity. We want to ensure that the space offers children a wide range of experiences, those opportunities for adventure. Remember that adventure keeps children in the play spaces for a longer period of time and more fully engaged in play. In a forest, it is natural for children to engage in balance, jumping, scampering. We can take these kinds of principles and build them into um, play spaces in our areas. Risk taking is a very important part um, that we want to incorporate into the space. So when we think of risky play, this is vital for us um, in our design elements. Um, we can think of children who have said, I dare you, I don't think you will do that, etc. That risky play piece is absolutely vital for children to be able to push themselves to see what happens. Um, renowned researcher Mariana Brassoni advises that if children do not go far enough with their play, it's boring. And if they go too far, it then gets scary. But we want to find out is how we can support children in having that sense of risky play uh, while reducing the injuries um, and ensuring that safety standards are adhered to. We have to remove any chance of children uh, not only engaging um, in healthy risk, but how to manage it. So how do we figure that out uh, so that we are lowering the injuries? Often, as Brosoni uh, will identify, is it's the fears of the parents and caregivers that get in the way of giving the children the freedom to explore. Uh, worries such as kidnapping and injury and the fear of people thinking they're bad because they're allowing the children this freedom um, to engage in risky play causes parents to take a step back and um, sometimes um, halting the play. What we want to ensure is that our designs are um, offering children that need for risky play and it, because it correlates directly with problem solving and critical thinking skills. We want the natural play spaces to bring fill, uh, bring thrills to the children. So think about how we can engage space that will allow those thrills to naturally occur. Climbing trees is a good one, zipping across a cable on is another way in which we can bring that thrills and risk to children. Swings allowing the children to have the power on um, to actually engage in the sense of freedom in, in the air and having the um, ability to go quickly. If children do not have the thrills, um, they will find ways to try and build that thrill. And that's when we uh, have an increase in injury. Children require those wide ranges um, of experiences. So how do we stimulate the imaginations and creativity? What in the environment will offer that sense of challenge, novelty, and complexity to the children? How do we offer them opportunities for there to be multiple ways in which they can engage in play? Look at it from nurturing a love of plants and, and animals. And certainly we know that children learn through their senses. So when we create a space that engages in all five of the senses, um, it helps us provide an understanding of their world. It helps the children understand where they are positioned in their world and who is in their world with them. Um, thinking about children touching caterpillars, how does that support them in learning about nature and caring um, for items and life within nature? 
how do we support them in having that taste of that wild blueberry and, and moving forward from there? Look at the, the animals. What kind of animals are in the environment and how does it support children um, in embracing opportunities to explore their environment more fully? Wild creatures have certain qualities that make them mysterious and exciting uh, to the children. So we want the, them to have special powers like flying and digging and climbing, uh, just as the animals do. Children will take on those roles. Remember that children need to explore hills and paths. Um, this gives them the freedom to um, find out what their body can do to access the resources um, internally to be able to take on that challenge and to give them a sense of their world. This is how um, the topography increases children's engagement in deeper thinking and using their critical thinking skills to assess the space and determine how to move forward. We want the high structures, the uneven surfaces, and the different sized boulders um, to evaluate the options for children and help them do a risk benefit analysis. Am I ready to do this? If I am, how far can I go? And if I get to an area of the boulders and it is not good for me, how do I reframe my thought process? So it's all of that thinking that we want to offer children uh, in this space. We want to look at the special places for children um, because it is through those special places um, where children um, reconfigure their thought processes. It helps them to um, have a quiet time or collectively um, engage in some of those experiential peer opportunities for learning and experiencing. These um, types of spaces are of particular importance um, to children with autism or other neurodevelopment disorders. And as we know, it is through these spaces that children can regain their equilibrium and work through some of the stressful events or the triggers for stress in their lives. Building many worlds is a vital part for children um, because this allows them to be creators, destroyers, and redesigners of their own world. This is how they um, gain the um, principles of science, technology, engineering, and math, or what we call the STEM principles. These skills then transfer to their later academic skills. It is very easy for us to create these mini ecosystems in play spaces. It can be with water, it can be a tree stump. Um, these are how children learn about nature, um, both the natural world and those of the artificial elements that we put into the space. When we look at enabling hunting and gathering, we see this as a very important part of children's play um, because not only is it the elements of the senses, um, but this is how children associate on the connectedness of caring for families and caring for peers. This type of dramatic play is how children develop empathy, self-regulation, and executive functioning skills. So again, when we look at uh, reviewing design principles, we want to ensure that our play spaces have all of the key elements uh, that you have on your screen. We want to ensure that whatever space is built, that you are offering children a variety of experiences um, so that they learn new skills and connect with nature and also have that sense of ownership uh, when they play in the experience. There are seven design um, principles that we're going to review at this point. Um, and um, when we look at these again, it is important for you to be thinking of the space that you embrace and engage with on um, with children and families or maybe involved in designing how are you incorporating these principles um, so we're looking at the place structures the water the uh, natural gardens trees slopes the seating the shelter on um, the surfacing and the unique add-on
And so it is really important to look at the, the natural clay structures. Um, the Rubino on tree is very important because it has a natural um, curving shape and it um, allows the children to actually be able to manipulate the space. There are no toxic chemicals uh, required to treat this wood. And it allows, uh, again, that natural element to be built into the environment. Uh, we want the place structures to have three key roles, the physical challenges, the risk, fear, and excitement, and the social activities. And um, so what is important is that these elements then support uh, the risky play and that we become comfortable in building this into the space. Safety and sustainability are vital to us, um, particularly as we look at the play spaces uh, for children and the importance of risk versus hazard or serious injury. Uh, when we look at um, some of the manufacturers now, we do see that wooden equipment um, is becoming part of the natural movement. Um, if you decide to use wooden structures, it is important to look at the CSA standards. Water also is a, a vital part on, of the environments. Uh, how can you create these experiences for children um, so that they have the opportunity to mix wet and dry so that they can see um, how to use water pumps and all of those um, scientific principles that support um, children learning about science, technology, engineering, and math, because again, they are necessary um, for later academic skills. When we look at the environment, what are the natural gardens? Uh, shrubs, trees, rocks, and slopes that are being put into the environment. How are, we, how are we using these for our pathways? How are we offering children opportunities to interact with their environment? Um, how do we support children having exposure to natural insects or bringing birds to the environment? What is it we can do so that children are always connecting live nature with their play? Um, looking at the natural slopes, that is absolutely vital for the physical development of children as well as for the risk taking. So think about how you build those naturally into the design. The seating is very, very important, not only from the perspective of children uh, requiring time out. We know that when adults are uh, in a seated area, it increases then the opportunity for children to engage in deeper thinking rather than having adults uh, mingle around where the children are actually engaged in the play. It is also important to support uh, the diversity of society and understand that each individual will have different needs for um, sitting at a particular time. We want the natural seating for the children as this is how they uh, reconnect with their peers and where play is invented. Play opportunities are refocused and reflection occurs. Natural shelters are absolutely vital, particularly as we look at the notion of melanoma, uh, skin cancer, and the rise uh, of it across Canada. This helps us to be able to support families in understanding the importance of outdoor play. Surfacing is absolutely vital so that children have different uh, experiences in the play space um, because this um, reinforces children using their bodies in different ways for balancing and understanding the kinesthetics uh, of their environment and their body. Unique add-ons are on um, what we want to see in the environment from the musical instrument perspective. Um, this strengthens the children's fantasy and imagination. So what we know is that um, Ellen Sandsetter has identified categories of risk play. So you're looking to ensure where the heights are, the high speeds, where children can play with tools, uh, near the elements, uh, looking at getting lost in the rough and tumble play. It is proven um, that when these risk factors are involved in the environment, it increases the quality of children's play. No matter what the play space is that you are working on, it is the thoughtful planning that will provide the exciting, aesthetically pleasing and engaging uh, experiences for the children. 
and therefore supporting learning and development. It may be simple to uh, look at choosing the equipment from a catalog, but in fact, we need to do it with more intensity and understanding what we choose and the impact to child's to the children's health and development. Natural place spaces do not cost Doug anymore. Uh, it is just a different approach. Thank you, and I'm now going to turn it back to Susan so that she may introduce you to the case studies. Great, so I'm just gonna cover um, a couple of case studies that um, we've had experience working with, um, with installations uh, throughout Western Canada. And um, so I'm gonna take a look at four uh, separate parks. The first one is Kinsman Park in Saskatoon. Uh, the picture that uh, you can see on the screen is of course the end result but it was designed as part of the downtown revitalization and located along the Saskatchewan River. Kinsman Park in Saskatoon is a memorable park for all ages. The planning began with a public engagement process that included interviewing students in grades three and six. The feedback back from the students and the community members were all, they, they all wanted natural play elements. Now, one of the things that I did not clarify is why they decided to choose children from grades three and six. So there may be some you know, background to that that I'm not aware of. After planners toured natural parks in some of Vancouver's neighborhoods, they began to form the design for Kinsman Park. They had to ensure the wooden structure was CSA compliant, and they were keen on having a water pump. They also wanted to ensure the space encouraged social, socialization. The mature, mature trees were kept in the space to keep the shade and ecological integrity of the space, and the Saskatoon Nordic Club uses the park in the winter for skiing activities. Since its installation in 2015, actually in 2016, Kinsman Park has become a destination park. Forsyth Park in uh, Surrey, British Columbia. Um, I personally was involved in this one, so I have a lot of uh, insight. But uh, Forsyth received a $500,000 grant from the TD Common Ground Project. A key element to the TD Common Ground and TD Friends of the Environment Foundation was to have an environmental focus for play spaces and to bring the community together. For the city of Surrey, this fit with their design, which was to have a more natural playground. While the area has high density population, the city wanted kids and other park users to have more of a natural experience within the urban area. The TD nature play area of the park has natural materials, wood, boulders, and features a water run that channels through the playground area. There's a lot of opportunities for kids to play on wood and rope structures as well as swing and slide. There's also lots of opportunity for them to play, play with loose parts such as sticks, logs and rocks and create what comes into their imagination. The city says projects like this help the residents understand the importance of biodiversity and the protection of the environment. There's nothing like having children immersed in a natural space to engage with for the protection of the environment. This park was totally transformed from a rundown, crime-driven environment to a family-friendly space for all family members, including dogs. They included a very large um, uh, separate dog area for large dogs and small. If you want more details on this particular park, you can get the information from the uh, Surrey website. So Ian's Forest uh, in Leduc, Alberta was installed in 2018. The city of Leduc's planning department was mandated to build playgrounds with natural elements. Planners had to explore what natural play actually meant to council. It was determined that for safety reasons, fabricated natural elements that were CSA and FSC certified were appropriate. 
The city has five areas where natural play elements will be developed, all within an area that borders the Leduc Reservoir, the Trans-Canada Trail, and a natural forest. So the city of Leduc shows us how easily we can offer a natural play space with an existing natural community space. So this map that um, is up on the screen shows five play spaces. Two of them are completed with the um, ongoing development for three, four, and five. Um, and I'm not sure what the time frame is on them pursuing that. So our last um, uh, case study is Memorial Park. And that is in Ladner, British Columbia. And the second phase of Ladner, uh, of this Memorial Park, was in 2019, so just recently. So Delta has embarked on a program to replace the traditional playgrounds within city parks with natural playgrounds. Moving away from structured play, the city decided to, to build a natural play space to encourage risk-taking and imagination. The playground at Memorial Park, largely funded by the REACH Youth and Child Development Society, is open to all members of the community and is geared to all ages. The children attending the REACH facility generally are developmentally delayed, and providing a safe but challenging space was critical to the programming of the facility. A five-ton tree was salvaged from a development site in South Delta and is one of the central play features. Boulders, cedar leaping posts, a Persian ironwood tree, and a two-seat swing were added in the middle of the walkway tricycle racing track around the perimeter. A bench provides for seating and cuddling in a quiet corner, and a gravel pathway around a tree is planted with little bunny fountain grass and lavender added to the adventure. These were all great additions, but the space was lacking in other play types, and the natural elements did not satisfy all users. Therefore, while the theme of the playground is natural play, with some risk, in 2019 the city realized that they needed to include some elements of natural wood to provide other play options for the children to enhance the activity with the natural elements. There was a desire to have a climbing element and sliding element in the park, so the net climber attached to the tower, along with a slide and a spiral fireman's pole, provided these options. The net climber and spiral pole provide the risk for some children and therefore meet the theme of the park. The village shop, the little playhouse, uh, provides a much needed quiet area for, for kids to have a breather from all the action of the playground. The children from the REACH facility require some locations where they can get away from all the hubbub of the park. There is still lots of room for imagination in both the tower and the village shop that won't restrict the kids in their play. So um, this wraps up the webinar. Um, the Wildlife Trust says we are hardwired to be part of the natural world. Proactively providing opportunities to play in nature is more critical than it was for past generations of children, as their opportunity to do so spontaneously has diminished in the face of more built-up suburbs, manicured parks, and backyards, restricted freedom to roam within their neighborhood, and greater time spent in sedentary and indoor activity. With the help of natural environments, natural materials, and a commitment to connecting kids with nature, we can bring nature back into our lives and minimize the impact of nature deficit disorder. Thank you everyone for attending. We would like to open it up for um, questions and Beverly and I will share uh, in the answers. So, we've had a couple um, come in. Um, so the first one that came in, um, in your experience, what has been the biggest challenge you face with regards to people's understanding of what a natural play space is and how did you overcome it? 
from my perspective, the biggest hurdle is the perception that wood materials require more maintenance. And certainly, if you're using natural logs, natural logs from the forest, they're going to rot. They are going to deteriorate. So they need to be inspected. They need to be ensured that there are no splinters, that there's not any um, uh, wasp nests or anything that is hazardous to the children. But the uh, natural play elements are a must for those kinds of environments. The manufactured products, they um, are, are made from high density materials that require little to no maintenance and are, are much different than uh, what we used years ago. So um, uh, this question, Beverly, I think uh, you'd best answer. We have a daycare. How are licensing bodies part of the decision-making process? That is a great question, and it is very important um, that we have the licensing inspectors part of the design process. Um, because we can go through the design process and think that we have what we are what we want and what the children are telling us they, they want. But if we are unable to get it approved by the licensing and then from the health department, um, it decreases the opportunity for people to take the risk to engage in putting risky play options into their space. So it's always good to have that partnership um, with the licensing officer. And it's also a way in which we can and actually introduce to the licensing officer the child development attributes that the children will gain um, from having the ability to play on that space. Great, thank, thank you Beverly. Um, and actually this uh, ties right into what you just uh, responded to, but can you speak to strategies to educate community groups, planners and licensing bodies about risky play? For sure, this, this is always a challenge because as soon as we hear the word risk and play, we think of accidents. So it is vital for community groups to actually open up their spaces and allow the children and the communities to come forth and play with uh, those neat pieces, whether we call them loose parts or within the playground, and have information available um, to the families and to the community groups as to why it is vital for the children to have exposure um, to the materials in the environment or the, the climbing apparatus. Uh, so it is making the information about the, what is in the play space uh, visible to the families and, and to the communities. And of course, to the, the landscape architects, um, they need to be sharing why they're doing what they are doing in, release, in relationship to child development. We always need to tie back to child development and help um, those that are involved to understand it's more than just setting up a play space. It's the foundation for child development. Great, thank you. Um, Another question, uh, is the price of the equipment a lot more than standard play equipment? Um, and I'm assuming they mean a wood-based structure versus uh, a traditional metal per se. Um, no, and in fact, from our experience, sometimes they're even less. Um, depending on equipment chosen, um, activities included, there actually is no um, upcharge to, to going with a natural play space. Uh, I think we also need to look at the return on investment from the play value. So when you look at uh, a metal play space versus one that is wood and, and has um, other options for play, the children's ability to gain quality play experiences uh, needs to be considered in the formula. Yep, I totally agree. Um, another question that's come in, it says, how does the Robinia wood compare to the wood used in past playgrounds? 
Um, the Robinia wood is a natural uh, aging and um, deterioration resistant um, natural wood. So there's no treatment process on the Robinia product. Um, so it, uh, it naturally uh, resists rot. It, um, and actually I'll just add a little bit to that because um, the Robinia wood actually comes with a 10 year warranty and it also um, comes with a two year service agreement. Um, all natural wood is going to split check to a certain degree and the two year service agreement through Compan actually addresses that um, cracking and checking. Um, typically, um, that type of activity occurs in the first couple of years of installation with different weather patterns, you know, weather changes from hot to cold. And during that time, the service agreement will address those, um, those issues. Uh, Robinia also uh, is naturally aging, so we'll go to kind of a, a dull gray look over time. And um, they've, they've done all kinds of uh, testing and research, and the Robinia product has been submerged in water for 40 years and is still 100% um, um, durable. So um, one more question, looking at combining some natural elements like logs, etc., how can we make a playground meet CSA with these elements? Well, you can't make logs and rocks CSA. And um, part of it is understanding the design and placement of those products within your space. Proper spacing is required, obviously not putting a rock and a log in a fall height of other types of components, but you cannot make natural materials CSA compliant because they, they don't fall into that category. Uh, one more, uh, when designing natural playgrounds, how is inclusivity kept in mind? It's uh, no different than any other playground. Um, inclusive play, in my opinion, is in the forefront. Every new playground that gets involved, installed should be inclusive. And that should be the first line of discussion when you're developing a new space. And that can often be um, the use of certain materials for the surfacing. Um, I like to see a combination of surface materials because kids, not only do they need the resiliency, so you might use a, a pour in place rubber or an engineered wood product, but it's lovely to in, in include an asphalt pathway, a wood boardwalk. You know, riding your tricycle over a wood boardwalk is a totally different experience than riding it over an asphalt path. So um, selecting the right equipment, Knowing your user group and uh, selecting the right surfacing will um, be um, critical in making the sp play space um, inclusive. Uh, should, we do, um, should we do one more? Yeah, the one more. The, we have one more question. Do you have support documents on guided play versus unstructured natural play? Beverly? Do you, um... And, well, it, that's a really interesting question. And um, my response would be, the more unstructured natural play that children can engage in versus guided play, the better it is for the overall development. And I'm assuming when I, when I read guided play, that it is adult on guided. Um, so I would certainly um, caution individuals and thinking about guided play as um, one which occurs in unnatural play spaces or unnatural, um, unstructured natural play. We want that unnatural or unstructured play so that children do have the freedom to explore and determine how they wish to um, take the play episode. Um, we certainly have lots of documents that talk about on the importance of um, children being in natural environments and um, how that increases uh, the, the quality of the play experience. We don't 
do a lot about guided play because it would be uh, in very rare situations that we would support uh, guided play unless there are children uh, that you are trying to increase their their play experiences for those that um, are fairly new to the, the play the indoor play world and so I would just have a bit of caution uh, on that one. I, I totally agree with you, Beverly. Um, it, you know, it's never been in my, in my career in the playground industry, it's never been my forte to have things so structured that there's a, you know, a, a one-way entrance, a one-way exit, up the stairs, down the slide, and you're done. So um, being able to offer just unstructured play is, is primarily the goal. Okay, um, so there's one other question. How are community groups or planners working with their liability or insurance agents to handle the risk? Or, um, honestly, I can't answer that. I don't know um, the answer to that. Do you have any insight? So let me sh uh, share with you that there are some insurance agencies, particularly those that insure schools and um, some of the child care centers in central Canada, and they are now working together to look at the importance of risk to play and how that um, actually is vital for the children. And the whole notion is to support um, this type of play by ensuring that uh, designers and um, those that are responsible for the play spaces are doing the risk benefit analysis of the space and then to um, examine if there is uh, an issue on how to correct that. Uh, so insurance companies right now are putting information in their newsletters to their clients about why they are supporting on outdoor play and particularly on playground equipment. So it's a real shift on right now in the current I would be very pleased that um, there are some that have need on this because um, they too are now understanding in order to support children we need to be looking at risk and play in a positive way. Great. Well, thank you. Um, for those of you, uh, I think we went, got to every one of the questions, but if we didn't, we'll go through them and we will respond um, directly. Um, if there's any other questions or comments or um, input that you'd like to share, please feel free to reach out to us or myself directly, uh, and we're happy to help. Thank you again. Um, the uh, the webinar will be on the website, so if anybody was late in joining us or would like to review it in more detail, it will be on the website, both the RecTech and PlayWorks websites, very shortly. So thank you again, um, and I hope everyone has a good day.